Well, exposure. Now that is one of the big problems in life, isn't it? Getting the exposure right. Um, but I hope that this will help you do it. This uh, Give me one or two tips, I hope. Okay, cheers. Whenever I refer to a sensor, I do, of course, include film, as the problem is exactly the same. When light goes through the lens, it illuminates the sensor. The amount of time this light hits the sensor is called the exposure. A well-exposed photo is one in which sufficient light has reached the sensor to record all the detail you require in the dark areas and not too much light to destroy the required detail in the bright areas. The exposure time is controlled by the shutter speed, the aperture and the sensitivity to light of the sensor. This is adjusted by the ISO rating required. The higher the ISO, the more sensitive the sensor. These three things are all controlled on the camera. I've also dealt with each of them in more detailed lessons on this channel. All digital cameras, both amateur and professional models, have built-in meters that can automatically set aperture and exposure. And most people set the, the camera on auto, then just frame the shot and shoot. If you're taking snaps or just recording a scene, this is fine, and very good shots can result. It means, of course, the camera will decide what style of photo you take. Now, I don't like being told what to do, especially by a robot. I don't know about you, now by using the manual features on the camera, where you control the shutter speed, aperture and ISO, will give you much more choice of a style that can enable you to create photographs to be proud of. Now if all else fails, read the instructions. Cameras vary from make to make and the instruction book is often complicated, repetitious, tedious and boring. I'll give you some guidance based on a typical Canon SLR digital camera. Maybe after the lesson, check with your book as a reminder. Now, apart from automatic, we have three main choices. We have M, which is totally manual. AV is aperture priority. Um, now, this can be very helpful. You select the aperture to give the depth of field you want, and the shutter speed will automatically adjust to the conditions to give the correct exposure. Another setting is TV. Now this is shutter speed priority. That means the shutter speed will stay at whatever you set it and the camera will change the aperture setting automatically. Now these two modes are known as being semi-automatic. So the only thing you have to do is set the ISO and that depends on the light that you have around. Um, the aperture in the case of the um, AV setting and the shutter speed in the, in the case of the TV setting. So that makes it easy. And I highly recommend anyone who's using a camera manually for the first time to start with these semi-automatic settings. Manual is exactly what it says. You take over, you're totally responsible for those great shots. Now the other settings are more really to be taught in a, in a lesson about the camera, so we'll leave those for the moment. A separate exposure meter can be useful as it can measure the incident light as well as reflected light. Incident, li incident light is the light falling on the subject. So it's important to decide what part of the image you want correctly exposed. To shoot, for example, a motor car engine under the hood or bonnet, as we call it in England, we must measure the light falling on a middle tone under the bonnet. If we measure the light on a nice chrome shiny part, then the image will be exposed for that component, and the rest of the image will be dark. If we measure the light on a dark part inside the bonnet, the chrome piece may lose all the detail, because this can be overexposed. In this kind of situation, it's better to use a spot meter in your camera, directed at something that is a mid-tone, or an incident light meter, incident light meter, that will measure the light falling on the subject rather than the light reflected from it. So as it's important to read the exposure on something mid-tone, most professionals carry a piece of mid-grey card to place on the subject, 
making sure that an even light falls on it while avoiding any reflections that might give a wrong reading. Mid-grey cards are available from good photographic stores, although I'm a bit of a cheapskate and I tend to find other solutions. How should we then expose for a high key image? Slight overexposure, making the image lighter, is the best way. Maybe half a stop to two stops, more than the exposure given on our famous grey card. Now this is only theory, as a lot depends on the subject and lighting. I'll show you more in the lesson on portraits. What about a landscape situation, when you want a general exposure but one part of the image, such as the sky, is too bright? Well, a graduated filter, like a coquin, can be used to assist in getting the right exposure. These are filters that start transparent and gradually get uh, to a colour or a neutral grey. Now, I'm sorry, but that also has to be part of another lesson, as filters are a very big uh, subject. Now, a lot of people ask me about photographing the moon. Well, the correct exposure for the moon shots depends greatly on the quarter of the size of the moon. Um, so full moon at 200 ISO would be around 250th at f11. In the first quarter, it would be around 60th of a second at f11. The large crescent, around a 30th of a second at f11. And the thin crescent, about a quarter of a second at f11. Now, taking romantic shots, shots by moonlight with no other lights will need an exposure of around 20 to 30 seconds. So if you've got people in the image, they better be still. Now, in both these situations, it's worthwhile shooting bracketed exposures, which means taking pictures at different exposures. Your camera probably has an automatic bracket setting. It will take either, either three or five photographs of the same scene with exposures around the setting that you've made. Now these photographs can be used for an HDR conversion as you see here, um, but that's a totally different subject. And now what about shooting fireworks? Well, this is a bit of trial and error, but I'd start with an ISO of around 200 and expose for four seconds at f11. Now, this will give you a guide, but as fireworks go off one after another, you could do a, a much longer exposure, up to 20, 30 seconds, and you can capture several exposures, explosions, on one image. And I must say, the same goes for lightning. Uh, it's exactly the same system. Now, the strange thing is, with helicopters, is that the rotors turn very, very slowly. And there's nothing worse than having the blade static. Um, so a shutter speed of 60th will make a nice movement but still make them visible. It's important with moving shots to use a shutter speed that's not too short and not too long. It's very difficult. It's a question also of trial and error. Now I've shot a lot of cars in my time. That was my speciality for around 20 years. Well, panning shots uh, of a car, let's say a racing car, I'd use 125th of a second with quite a long lens. Um, that's fine if you're good at uh, panning. If you want to stop the wheels turning, you'll need at least, at least 500th of a second, but that depends on the speed of the car. There's another nice technique. It's, it requires a, quite a long exposure considering, and it's panning with a wide angle. If you can get nice and close to the car, uh, at around 50th, um, 30th of a second. It gives really nice result, like this shot. Well, I hope you've learned a lot about exposure and it will help you in your photography. Uh, we'll have other, less other lessons on mccall.com, uh, so don't hesitate to come and visit us. Bye.